A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. Welcome, everybody. We're here with Bob the Scooter, um, uh, PhD, an award-winning game designer, researcher, educator, and advocate for meaningful play in later life. And we're here to talk about later life. Uh, He's a professor of applied game design at Northeastern University, where he's jointly appointed between the College of Arts, Media, and Design and the Curry College of Computer Science. Uh, He's also uh, the owner of award-winning game company, Lifelong Games. Um, uh, Bob the Scooter, welcome to the show. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, hmm. uh, um, I, I, I thought we'd start with this. Uh, hopefully, uh, most people don't think of uh, video games as kid stuff anymore. Uh, lots of people do, but hopefully, most of the world has moved on. Uh, but neither do most people think of video games as something that lots of older adults actually engage in. Um, and, um. Do older adults play video games, and uh, do you expect that more and more of them will be playing video games in the future? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's a question that I've obviously get asked a lot. So, I, so I've got some numbers on that, actually, in my back pocket. Um, like, the latest Great. ones that I remember on this are about 45% of 50-plus-year-olds in the U.S. are playing games now. And that number has gone up quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, and the best part is, like, it's not just that, you know, whenever you do this kind of research, like, oh, what does it mean to play games, right? Well, about half of that group plays every day. Like, these are people that are really playing games. And, you know, it it, it drops off, but you still have, like, a quarter of them that are still playing uh, multiple times a week and so forth. So in absolute terms, um, it's about 50-ish million uh, 50-plus-year-olds that play games in the U.S. alone. Uh, Worldwide, obviously, a heck of a lot more than that. Um, and you know, with that, like, I hope they're all tuning in today. Cause that's obviously a number that as a content creator, you would love to get, um, but you know, <laughs> what I also do is like, as a teacher of game design, like that's what I'm telling my students, right? Like if you're an indie developer, um, and I put this in a steam context usually, cause that's what the students get. Like if you think of steam, like the most popular PC platform for games, there's been four or five games. I think that, um, peaked over 1 million concurrent players, like at the same time. So that's 1% of the 50 plus demographic right now. So right. if somebody out there makes a game that the 50 plus demographic is really into it, only 1% is what you need. You can play the algorithm of Steam. You can get your game to the front page. And anyone, you know, in the game industry that's making indie games or AAA as well, you know, that's where you get your sales from. You just need to make it to the front page. There's all these tricks right. to get there, you know, trying to manipulate Reddit, trying to manipulate social media and getting your game there. So this is, always in my opinion a way that's like the first person that really figures out a game that does that um within the hardcore gaming landscape is is going to make quite a splash but we already seen splashes like that of course i mean the word will affect during during covid was very clear on what can right. happen when all of a sudden an older uh, yeah. demographic gets into it so are they playing like yes a lot of older adults are playing but there's also a lot of them that are not playing like if you have 45 percent of them playing that means uh, is it 55 percent that aren't playing um, so right. my guess is, um, a lot of people are going to continue to play and, and, um, we're going to see more 50 plus year old players moving forward. In fact, um, for me, I have this little game for myself, I guess. Um, you know, it was t- 2016, I think at GDC at the game developers conference in San Francisco, where I, I had a talk about this for the very first time. Um, and I was like, I want to make a projection, right? So I looked at the the numbers that we had. And back then we had about 35 million people over 50 playing, according to the stats. So I, you know, I, I looked at the United Nations statistics and everything and see like, where could this number end up? And I was like, well, let's just take population aging because our, our you know, our population is aging rapidly. We're seeing higher um, quantities of 50 plus year olds. So what would that do? And with that, I, I saw a little bit of an uptake and you could say then like, you know, by 2045, I think, was the year that I was shooting for. We should get about 60 million players over um, over 50 that are playing, which is neat. But then I was like, yeah, but that's not how it works, right? Because like, I see myself as someone who's going to be playing games for the rest of my life. Right, so what yeah, are the people sure. that have been playing, you know, that have grown up with the culture, that are really into games? What do they just keep playing? 
So I made a different one. And um, that projection got me to over 105 million by 2045. So then you're really talking about a huge amount of older players. And that's just in the US alone. Um, question like. Um, so how are you how are you finding the the data for for who's playing yeah. games? Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, so. I'm just in, in the interest of full disclosure. So I'm I'm working closely with AARP, so the Association of Real Possibilities. It used to be retired persons. That's how people uh, remember them, but they rebranded that because they real more than possibilities. Just really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not that many people <laughs> know that yet. I've I've noticed, but I didn't I didn't um, know that. And I literally just got a letter from them yesterday. They're very good at that kind of marketing. <laughs> they came to me to, to 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 talk to them about this topic, and I've made a lot of strides in, in trying to be an advocate for older players because uh, I'm sure that's something that we'll talk about a bit more as well moving forward. But like, there, you know, this is not the most common topic. Like when I started doing this type of work in uh, 2004, is when I did uh, when I originally started working on wow. it. My PhD, I finished in uh, 2011. But um, yeah, like back then it was like a huge taboo. Like it was not something that 50 plus year olds were supposed to do. I even had a professor tell me like, don't waste your time on this. Like, right. well, I'm glad I didn't that... waste my, well, I didn't waste it, but like, you know, it ended up being a really good topic for me later on. You could but, have studied um, the people who were turning 30 then, and now you'd be <laughs> studying yeah, people who are turning yeah, 50 yeah. now, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you know, uh, you know, and Andy and I are from the first generation. So as we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in our 50s. Right. Uh, and, you know, when you say 50 and up, I mean, there's a huge difference between, mm -hmm. you know, uh, our generation, you know, that started playing the first first generation of, of video games or let's say arcades. Right, right. And, we got, you we know, got, we got computers consoles. when we were kids, you know. Uh, right. You know, uh, so, um, yeah, and, it would be something that he would just do on his own. Okay, so so we have this idea. Speaking of right, and I think this idea is you know certainly shared by uh, you know by lots and lots of people that you know the primary audience for uh, for games are kids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the way my parents look at it, and and when we often talk about video games in popular culture, it's the way we talk about it. But when that happens, when designers essentially cater to younger audience. Does that ever exclude older players? And when we talk about older players, I guess now we're talking in the 50 and above range. Um, no, like there are ways, obviously, that you can exclude um, older players. I think the biggest thing with it from my perspective is whenever I, I go talk somewhere, it's like, okay, this is not just the responsibility of designers, right? This is, you know, the designer plays a part in this, but inclusion is something that you do throughout an organization. Uh, marketing is a really, and communication in general is a really big part of how older players are excluded from games. So if all the marketing for games is frantic, it's loud, it's it's all about, you know, like oftentimes sexist or, or hyper-violent, like you're pushing them out. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a game that, yeah, like it is up, up tempo or it, it is something that has a lot of bells and whistles or, or loud bangs and flashes that it might not appeal. Like there are very good, I don't know, puzzle games even as well that have that type of stuff. It's just how you communicate it. Like I've met uh, during interviews, I've talked to so many people in my demographics that, you know, are 70, 80 years old that are playing Twitch speed racing games and stuff like Trackmania as an example, I bring up a lot. Cause that one, you know, that's the first time it, it, that was the watershed moment for me there where, you God, know, I, I walk in, I have an interview with a 75 year old, one of my first interviews in Belgium. And, uh, yeah, you know, I'm expecting what everybody would expect probably. And then we're talking Track Mania. I'm like, oh, I used to play Track Mania. I like that game. But Track Mania is loops. It's, you know, it's basically micro machines or, um, yeah, like, so, you know, he's like, oh, you want to play? I'm like, sure, let's play. And I got my ass handed to me because he was so <laughs> dang good at the thing. And like, you know, yeah, it, immediately for me, it was just like, okay, I need to make sure that I start talking about inclusion because the, in the inclusion is, is is more than just changing your game. It's not about a reductionist perspective where it's like we have to make sure everything's slower. Like you need really good accessibility. Sure, you need to make sure that um, everyone can play your game. You need to make sure that there's representation in your game. Um, and you need to make sure that you include them in your play testing because um, that doesn't happen mm. nearly as much as, as, as it should. But as long as yeah. you do what you would have to do anyways for, as a good game designer, I would argue, 
I don't think that there are huge changes that you have to make to a concept that you might already have that you feel this should be appropriate for all ages or appeal to all ages, rather. Um, of course, you can always make games specifically to an older demographic, but those are two different things in my mind. Yeah, I see my mom um, uh, interacting with her phone, um, and it's clear to me that nobody at Apple has ever done any sort of usability <laughs> testing with or you know any sort of ux testing with people whose fingers are a little shaky yeah no it's i mean so it's so anything you know, that's like, drag and drop related like those are very common accessibility issues and yeah like if you have any kind of shakes like you know it's it's mind-boggling the stuff that you will see once you actually do these kind of tests with with an older audience because it's right. like you know I remember I used to have this club where I just, this was not part of my research at all. It was just like, you know what, this is a service activity for me, but I would love to do this for this community where the university was at the time where I was working. And I brought 50 plus year old since some of them as old as 80, some of them literally 50 years old. And the stuff that you would just see in terms of that kind of thing, like where it's like, okay, everybody, we're going to play this game. We, you know, we had a computer, a computer lab, the game installed on everything, no technical barriers. We all decide this is a game we want to play. And then, you know, you play a game made by a AAA developer that you would say, you know, it's, it's, it's a card game. You think everybody's going to love it. Half of them are struggling with the tutorial <laughs> that you're mm -hmm. just like, I didn't even know that you could fail this tutorial. And all of a sudden I have somebody who is literally stuck fighting the tutorial character that they are playing and major AAA yeah. company. Like, so yeah, like there are all of these issues and like, if only they would, you know, cause this is not that I have a special sample or something. This is just a random group of people and most of them have already played a whole bunch of games so like these should be a group that will not struggle with this right so yeah right. There, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there but at the same time I, I see a lot of um like i think the last five years it's 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 taking off kind of uh the industry is really taking notice aarp got really involved is doing a lot of really great initiatives there as well which is amazing and like you know, there's a lot more companies now that, that are talking to me about like, okay, what can we do? How can, how can we do this better? Do you think that uh, because uh, the industry itself, the people who are making the decisions about these things are also getting older, people like yeah. me? No, I think that's a really big mm. difference. Um, oh, I don't know the number by heart, but I remember, um, I think in 2013, it was about 1% of the industry was 50%. So it's still a really low number. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that, I feel the industry could be better at its inclusion in the workforce for sure, because I've heard, you know, I talked to a lot of 50, a lot of 50 plus game developers love what I do, obviously. And like, some of these are people that I would never get a foot in the door with if I wasn't doing this work. So this is great for me too, because oh, I right. can learn, you know, that's something I tell my students always like, you know, you think you're good at game design, like, or you think your professor is good at game design. I'll tell you, whenever I talk to a 50 or 60 plus year old game developer, they are so much better at game design than me. Like every single time, because this is a craft that you get better at through experience. It's crystallized intelligence, as they call it. So, you know, like that is one of the things that I think a lot of studios would benefit tremendously from, from just making sure that we have diversity, not just in race and gender, but also in age um, and culture. And, and, you know, that you bring in people from all sorts of, uh, well, all different parts of society, including age, and that will help tremendously. But I think um, there is a change there for sure, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, can I just say, it's really interesting, uh, listening to this. Um, you know, uh, I, we, we live in LA and I, you know, uh, I, we, we teach at a film school and I'm always thinking about age, uh, especially as part of, uh, my wife's friends conversations, mm -hmm. uh, being over 50 in Hollywood as a woman. Uh, you know, is a is a, a really, really big deal and a challenge of that. And I've honestly never thought about it uh, for, you know, for video games because I'm not a designer. I'm a philosopher. Right. And, y y you know, uh, I think how much uh, it would be easy to essentially take older designers and say that uh, they don't understand the, the youth market anymore. <laughs> uh, if you're assuming that the market is just a youth market. Right. 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 And instead, if you're adding this other, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 million people who <laughs> are, you know, playing games who are, you know, becoming or not becoming gamers, staying gamers. Mm -hmm. Right. 
you know, mm-hmm. since Pong, you know, since playing Pong, uh, it's been a very, very long time that, that we've done this. Um, and uh, it's really interesting that the easiest, uh, most direct advice you're giving is just, hey, remember, uh, you know, you need inclusion from the very uh, beginning because that's part of you know, what, what your player base uh, is. And you need to remember that when it comes to designers, because, well, again, that's part of what your player base mm-hmm. is. Plus your designers obviously have the wisdom of people who have been doing this for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm no, about I'm... to you, Andy. Yeah, yeah, Why is thank, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you, for any designers listening, especially younger ones, like um, a lot of these things, you know, the International Game Developers Association has a special interest group for game accessibility. And that is really, whenever mm-hmm. it's accessibility, I always just refer to them. Like their resources online are absolutely insanely well documented and they'll they'll provide you mm-hmm. way more than mm-hmm. just for an older demographic. But, you know, if anybody, if an indie developer listening to this right now is just like, oh, I would love to be able to be, take a swing at being the person that has a game breakthrough with the 50 plus demographic become a member of IGDA and, and get into those resources because like it's all just right there for the taking and most of it's free. Um, so that's just, you know, one of the things that, that people can help themselves with. But um, I will say though, aside from the accessibility stuff, the part where I talk about more um, tends to just be like, okay, to what extent are the differences in content in, in, in terms of uh, game genre preferences and that. And there's a lot of stuff there as well. Um, you know, like things like designing towards people's strengths. Like I feel most of the time when we design for older adults or, well, me not in particular, I would say, but like when I see people design for, for older adults, it's always about like, okay, we need to do the brain games. We need to do the fitness stuff. It's all about like, right. what are the things that, that, that people, mm. you know, are struggling with? What could they get better at? You know, I, I have a colleague in, in Denmark, uh, Sarah Mosberg Iverson, who wrote a, a paper from a Foucauldian perspective about, you know, taming the disobedient older body because all the games that are designed towards them are about, you know, being young again and, and basically falling in line and not being mm-hmm. a detriment to society. While at the same wow. time, like, you know, you could flip that script entirely and you could start thinking about, like, what would a game look like if it's about the things that you're good at when you get older? Because developmental psychologists are all about, like, aging. Sure, there's always going to be decline, but there are skills that peak at when you're 50. Like, crystallized intelligence is the big one that, you know, um, anything that's experience related, this is, which is why word games, I would argue, are so popular with the demographic, because that's based on vocabulary. It's something that you keep accumulating. Um, right. The right. same way, you know, we've seen stuff like um, introspection, like the game that I worked on myself is all about reminiscing, um, you know, playing with people that you have close connections with, because as you grow older, your networks get smaller. So that's also something that you could really design towards or making games about emotional maturity and, and altruism are things that we've seen in surveys. Like what are the kind of games that you feel are lacking for, you know, aside from representation, right? Like what, what is lacking if you grow older and you would like more games that do this type of stuff. And, you know, and I mean, Shlomo, you might be able to, to, to speak on that. Cause like, I always look at, if you look at what has happened in the last couple of years from, um, from a film perspective, the amount of content that has come out specifically towards a 50 plus demographic, like almost every Tom Hanks movie where it's about trying to undermine stereotypes, like putting a 50 plus year old as a right. character that is multidimensional, not just, you know, like a supporting character, but a, a genuine lead. And it, it takes on all shapes and forms. Like, you know, I, I really liked the, what is it? The Kaminsky method with, oh, who was it again? I, I forgot what the <laughs> actor was, but, um, you know, like, uh, what is it, Will and Gracie? Like, there's so many of these right. shows mm-hmm. that have all very strong older protagonists. But in games, that doesn't right. really exist. And, and, you know, and, you know, as I think about getting older and I think about what kind of games am I going to want to play when I'm, you know, retired? Am I going to want to play the same games? You know, maybe I will be playing Civilization Ten because mm-hmm. why not? It's always going to be great. But, you know, it would be fantastic to get, games that are also more suited to the things that I'm, I'm interested in. And mm-hmm. I love the ideas that uh, the topics that, that you laid out. Uh, I, yeah. I want to move us forward and, and, yeah. and ask about, uh, you know, you know, Andy mentioned uh, the kind of shaking that uh, an older person might have, but mm-hmm. um, you know, and obviously uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, physical or, uh, or visual limitations, obviously, you know, seeing text, reading text is a really big deal for anybody over 50. 
anybody over 40, I think just about. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides that, what about the technology, uh, technology literacy, right? Uh, does mm-hmm. the role of uh, expectations about uh, techno- uh, technology literacy, uh, is, is there an, uh, an issue for that with older players? Because, you know, like everybody else, I've done tech support for my parents, <laughs> for, my, for my in-laws. You know, how much of that needs to be taken into consideration? Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the, the things that kind of got me started in the beginning as well. Like, I, uh, I didn't do tech support, but... Um, you know, I, I never had any funding to do a PhD. I, I, I got an MFA and, and then I wanted to go get a PhD, but I went from the arts to communication science, which is a very different field in a lot of ways, obviously. And, um, you know, I, I had a job while I was doing my PhD and that job was teaching 50 plus year olds how to use computers. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, like I'm teaching them Excel, I'm teaching them Word, but like that was what I was supposed to teach. But the first two weeks I'm getting people in because um, in Belgium, they had the system where if you worked in a factory, you could you know, you didn't have to go to work for a couple of hours if you took a class on something else, which I thought was great. But like most of the people I got never had seen a computer close up because they were literally conveyor belt factory line workers, you know? So I'm like, okay, how are we going to do this? And, you know, I got started and I'm like, well, they literally don't know how to type on a keyboard. They don't know how to use a mouse. So I started to play, um, uh, we used Tetris for for, uh, the keyboard. And what did we use for the mouse again? Like, yeah, a, a game as well, like something really simple. Um, and that's how we got going with it. And it's, you know, that's that's one Great. of the things like for that specific generation, you know, because when I uh, when I did that, that's obviously early uh, 20, uh, 2000s. But mm-hmm. um, for that generation, it, 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 the technical divide is, is, is substantial. And I think yeah. that's one of the things where we're going to see a major shift in the industry. Because like, you know, like you guys said, you're the first generation that grew up with the medium. Um, but I would argue for that generation, it is still very much a, a niche activity within the, the larger generation. While, um, you know, if you go 10 more years later, maybe 20 more years later, it turns, you know, gradually into something that's very mainstream and everybody in their childhood are, right, has played right. games in some shape or form. Right. And that's kind of as that right. group that's is right. shifting into 50 plus year olds, like we're going to see a major shift because what we were able to do, like, and you know, I don't want to bash my, my colleagues in academic research that much, but I think one of the things that has set my research aside in a lot of ways is I always took that perspective where it's like, okay, games is about culture. It's about always about culture. Like it's something that people identify with in a lot of ways. And um, I always saw my, you know, the research that was out there, especially when I started doing it coming from professors that didn't have any connection to that culture. And they're making games where it's just like, yeah, this is so stereotypical about how they see older age. It has no connection with how anybody would want to play games at all. And it is so instrumental. It's almost an app rather than a game. And some did it better than others, I would argue. But, you know, that's kind of where I think we're going to see a really big shift. Because right now, as a game developer, if you want to target the the 60, 70 plus uh, market, like, yeah, your game doesn't really have to be good. Like... If you can market it properly and you can get them to play it, like they're not going to have all these connotations on what a good game is. That's going to shift mm. tremendously. Um, and with that, like technical affordances will change as well, I think. Right now, we're seeing that mobile is really big with older players because it is more intuitive to use, probably. Um, PC is still up there because a lot of them had to learn how to use a PC at some point. Consoles are not very popular, with the exception of the Wii, which isn't too surprising, probably because of the embodiment, but also because Nintendo actually marketed the Wii towards solar players in a lot of ways. I I was going to ask about that. I I had heard a rumor, and maybe you can confirm or deny this rumor, that when the Wii came out, Nintendo gave a bunch of Wiis to old, like retirement community homes, Um, and uh, which you know, which got these 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 people playing these games but also it it was sort of a genius marketing play because Mm. if they if these people had fun they bought them for their grandchildren Mm -hmm. Mm, interesting yeah so yeah, they would be like was, playing tennis and things like that back in the yeah, yeah. original right, right. Wii, Doing right? The, the Wii sports and the, right. the golf and the tennis and those those physically embodied games that he was talking about. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I've never because heard it that was, rumor because it was so accessible. Up. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I need to find a way to uh, to confirm that because it's such a great. Yeah, no, idea. it's it's fascinating. Uh, but, I mean, what I can tell you is obviously like Wii sports was a huge hit. Like it's one of the most popular titles amongst the 50 plus 
demographic and you know the competitions of wee bowling are very very real <laughs> and it's very noticeable right the only thing i yeah. don't like about that specific story but I'll, I'll keep that short so we can move forward with the with, with the conversation but it's just like i hate how every time it gets into the media it is always white people playing the nintendo wii mostly men while in reality then you know in reality if you look at the statistics there is um relatively speaking higher percentages of um bipoc um and latinx communities that are playing games over 50 but you never see it in the media it's always a big a stereotypical mm. image with it and that's very unfortunate because like nintendo we is is more diverse in its player base than what you would see in media right interesting uh, bob i want to move you back to talking about culture Right when yeah. when you were, were talking about, uh, I'm thinking about the culture of online gaming communities. Mm -hmm. uh, how do older players do with online gaming communities? Uh, how well do they fit in? Are they accepted? Are they alienated? Are they ostracized? Do they, in general, feel like they could become part of uh, online gaming communities? Well, um, most 50 plus players are playing offline. I think it's about 80 percent or something like that. So. Um, <laughs> It's a, uh, it's mostly a solitary activity. Um, but what we do see is, mm. you know, at this point, the, the industry and, and, and all the statistics that come out are looking at the 40 plus demographic as well, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, there's an upcoming shift there and you want to prepare for it. And we see that online play and really ha online play really happens with that demographic. Um, what I know about older players with communities is what, what I know from interviews. So there, there, I feel it's still an understudied topic in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, what I've seen is, uh, you know, online toxicity is not exclusive to younger generations. It is very prevalent in all its shapes and forms. Um, and it happens both in intergenerational play as well as in 50 plus online play. But at the same time, you also see so many wonderful, uplifting stories and interactions with people finding kindred uh, spirits. And, you know, just like really intergenerational knowledge transfer is something that you see happen a lot where, you know, you have 50 plus year old players that are playing in World of Warcraft in a clan with, with younger kids. And they are very much aware of right. the kids culture because they actually have conversations and vice versa. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a fascinating topic. It's, it's still under researched in my opinion. Um, I think, you know, the, the coolest interaction that, that, that I see there is where, you know, in, in this day and age, people move away from home a lot. Like <laughs> I was born in Belgium. My family right. lives in Belgium. Right. I live in the U.S. Uh, my mom doesn't play World of Warcraft right. or anything, but I've met a lot of people who actually have that kind of relationship with their parents where they're playing in the same clan together. So um, I'd say, oh, you know, for the online stuff mm. with the communities, um, the 40 plus demographic ones, online communities for definitely 60 plus and 70 plus, that's not an important part of it right now, um, which is kind of, contradictory to what you will see in media a lot of the times because the social aspects of gaming are often pushed as a reason on why they should be playing and i don't say that's necessarily wrong but when you really get into online and it goes beyond um just having a chat box where most of their conversations happen like a chat box on a website where you're playing a card game those things work well for a demographic mm -hmm. but anything beyond that it's 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 rare to to really get 60 70 plus players 50 plus you can find anywhere yeah, I can I can add a little bit to that. Just to, like two days ago, I was on a um, uh, on one of my Facebook threads, uh, uh, a role playing game group, uh, tabletop role playing game group, talking about like, hey, I'm 60 and I'm having a hard time finding people to play with, hmm. uh, and and how many people on this on this thread are are you know 50 or above, and it was it was quite surprising how many there were, right. And uh, and you were just talking about card games and so tabletop games. People play tabletop games. People play the you know electronic versions of tabletop games. Do um, you see a lot more of that with with the uh, with 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 older adults? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, it's always like whenever I talk the stats and I generalize, like it's always like this eighty twenty thing that you see in a lot of other phenomena as well, where you have twenty percent that are going completely against the grain of what you see for the general population, and it's like. Um, I've seen, you know, a lot of people who are playing RPGs for many different reasons, but like the, the stories that, that will always stick with me is when you have people that have given up on certain things in life as they grew older, whether it's because of medical conditions or not. Like I, somebody who's just like, well, I'm too old to really play football at this point. And when I say football, I mean what Americans would refer to as soccer, but, um, 
you know, right. so I love to play FIFA. Um, and it's not really for medical reasons or something like at some point, you know, it's just something you don't really want to do anymore. Or that just gets harder to do. Uh, you, but you I've also kids, seen people busy, who literally, you know, you know have like um, oxygen tanks in a, a grocery store cart when they move around the city because it's, you know, they, they need oxygen to do that. And it's really difficult. And who are mostly sitting at home and super isolated unless somebody drops by. And they're like, I, I will always remember this quote from, uh, uh, I think, a 68 year old lady. Who, who told me where, um, like, yeah, in, in Second Life, because she played a lot of Second Life, uh, I can wear heels and I can dance. And that's why mm. I play. And, Dang. you know, like, I, you know, a, a, as a man, that's something I would never even have thought of. But like, yeah, of course, like, if that's a big part of what your personality was, like, to just bring back that part of your identity virtually in a meaningful way. And, you know, as we talk about meaningful play, I think that's really where it's about. And that's why for me, I don't care about brain training or fitness games that much, you know, like it's about find meaning, find something that makes your life worth living. Right. Right. What about, um, what about, so this brings up an interesting idea that like, um, there was a certain, there's, there's games where you, you join because or you play because you're, you're, you're delving into a fantasy mm -hmm. as opposed to games where you're just, you know, trading cards or, 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 or taking tricks or doing, you know, basic you know card games that don't have that sort of fantasy element to it do you see do you see a lot of difference in like the 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 age groups of people who are playing games for fantasy versus playing games for the other social interactions of yeah of non -fantasy I mean, and, and that games. goes back really well to what you were talking about earlier with the board games like obviously the board game community um has a lot of people over 50 that are playing i mean i'm, I'm an avid board gamer myself like if you go to a gen con like that's not just for 20 year olds, obviously. Um, oh, sure. And I think the same thing with the fantasy part of it as well, you know, in, in interviews, you notice how people like how power fantasies really lose their power after people get to a certain age, because, you know, you're established in life. Like you don't have to listen to your parents. Like, why would you, you know, want to be the most baddest badass in the entire universe? And like, I mean, you know, th there are other things that are more interesting, right? Um, there, there are plenty mm -hmm. of games out there that explore meaningful themes or themes uh, like indie games. And, and, you know, those are a lot more popular in that kind of way. Um, um, I, I want to go back to uh, what you were the, the example you gave from World of Warcraft. Uh, yeah. it, it, it just struck me how incredibly unusual it is, you know, to for most people to be engaging collaboratively in an activity with a person that is substantially older than them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I can't think of anything outside of a, of a work situation, let's say, um, mm -hmm. uh, where that's been the case. And it's really interesting that games could potentially play that role uh, in society where nothing else, you know, I mean, for Family the most part, Family game nights, if your family kind of does that, right? But uh, for for the most part, we we don't have this kind of mixture of play by ages in in a lot of other. Um, at least it's not something I've encountered in my life, and I, I felt yeah. kind of weird, you know, when I uh, talked to my clan in uh, Class Royale and found yeah. out that I was the oldest by fifteen years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that the youngest one was eleven. Um, it it made me feel weird. It made me feel like a little bit, you know, hey, am I too old for this? Am, yeah, yeah. am I too old, you know, to tell them that they're talking stupid shit? Like, should I step in as the adult when they engage in, you know, particularly, you know, ridiculous or trollish behavior? Is it, you know, am, am, am I? But it's interesting that, uh, you know, you get these opportunities to engage with people who are considerably older and younger with you on an equal footing or equalish mm -hmm. footing where that's something extremely rare uh i think in in, in our society um okay yeah i mean and especially sorry with, you bob know, do you want to reply no, that or i can oh. yeah sorry uh <laughs> no i was just gonna say it like, wasn't really a question no. it was more like a I was just thinking like oh. you know it's also really hard to find that because i think that's kind of what you're alluding to because like the interactions I could see kind of in sports, maybe where, you know, you, you have people of, of, of different age groups doing stuff together, but there's always going to be defined roles. And like when you do Clash Royale, I think is a great example because I, I did that as well. And I had similar experiences where, 
you know, you, you, you don't have that much information about people in your clan because it's a very casual environment and there are no set roles for anyone to take while in real life, immediately you see each other and it's just right. like, you know, you start acting in a certain way and you, d you don't really have that online in, in, in the Clash Royale. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, Clash Royale is a really good example, I'd say, about how, you know, at its heart, it's a real-time strategy game. Like, it could just as well be StarCraft, but they designed it in a way to make it a really uh, easy to pick up with, with a beautiful learning curve. So anybody mm -hmm. could play it with touch controls and get that, mm -hmm. you know, that same kind of... The thing that makes it an RTS really awesome when you get good at it, you can get the same thing from Clash Royale with a, a completely different affordances. And that's, I love it about that game, but it also, you know, it, it's, in my opinion, it does that part of inclusion really well. Unfortunately, it also does, you know, the, I stopped playing it because of the monetization thing. And, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, can, that's another issue, of course. <laughs> I want to, um, all right, l l let me bring us back to, Bob, because what we were talking about monetization, because yeah. th this is kind of where I wanted to go next. Um, one of the things I talk about in my ethics of video games class uh, to my mm -hmm. students is uh, um, the kind of responsibilities when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, vulnerable populations. And of course, we talk about kids, right? Kids are your kind of classic vulnerable population. Uh, there are laws about how you can market the kids. There are laws about the kind of privacy the kids have. But the other classic vulnerable population are uh, essentially the elderly. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'm really curious about, um, you know, vulnerable population means that it's, uh, you know, it's much easier to scam them, let's say. And mm -hmm. there's always lots of different attempts to scam the elderly. Unlike kids, they actually have money uh, mm -hmm. and they actually have the ability to, to spend it. Uh, are there games uh, or microtransaction types or types of game marketing, marketing that target older adults uh, kind of directly? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, are there any kind of special things that they need to watch for uh, in order to make sure that they're not doing it in a kind of manipulative way? Yeah. No, I mean... I, I don't know if there is anything specific to uh, aging populations uh, there. Like, I'm not aware of games that are specifically targeting them yet. Um, I am expecting that to come around. I think it probably already exists. My my first thought would be like, I'm sure there are casino games out there that I don't play that are specifically targeting mm -hmm. an older demographic at this point. But oh, I've not yeah, actively looked we, for them. And about I, casino you know, games. like, this is just conjecture on for my sure. part. I will say, though, like, I mean... You know, as, as I'm sure you've noticed already, like, I'm not a huge fan of where video game monetization is at right now. Like, um, with Clash Royale, mm -hmm. I stopped playing it because of the loot box. I mean, you know, back in the day, it's like progress, you know, meant cheat codes, not paying more. Um, hidden characters came for free. Like, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 had, like, Spider-Man in it for free if you had the cheat code. Nowadays, that, that would never happen. And, I mean, it was for the same reasons, and it was, it, you know... Nowadays, it's to make money off of it that you buy extra characters. Back then, those characters were in there, so people would talk about the game and it would generate more money. So it's the same function, just a different way of doing it. But um, yeah, I you know like I you know I have a very strong basketball background, you know, being six eight and everything myself. And like um, you know, I used to love playing basketball games, and I haven't played a basketball game probably since 2013. And I know this because the games have the, the year in their title. So right, right. I used to play NBA 2K a lot. And then it turned into, first it, it turned into all about um, the, the, the the culture of basically kind of being a gangster type of thing or like, you know, being a baddest, baddest media personality. That's a better way of putting it. I hated that. I wanted right. to play basketball. I didn't care about an NBA lifestyle with bling and, and all that kind of stuff. That That's the thing they did first. And then it turned into pachinko and loot boxes and, Basically, to put your team together, you had to do the loot box thing to get the players. And, like, they literally have a pachinko thing in there. They had slot machines in there a couple of years ago. So, like, you know, that's where games have gotten to because this is a basketball game. And, like, when we talk about vulnerable po populations, right. um, you know, I am really not an authority when it comes to game addiction. But I do read a lot of papers on it because, you know, I'm interested. And um, I... I would say in the middle of the 2000s, I saw a shift from where at first 
game addiction was something that didn't really exist. Like the authority, like Mark Griffiths is like right. the big guy uh, there, I would say. And um, a lot of the research on that was talking about how it is very, very, very small percentages and almost non-existent. Then after uh, the middle of the 2000s, it turns into a genuine issue. It gets into the DSM-5 and everything. Um, part of it, I think, is online play. Like all of a sudden you have social factors making sure that people play a heck of a lot more than they used to. But I mm -hmm. also think it's the monetization, is the loot boxes that that because you know mm -hmm. you keep playing, you put more money. I mean, it's literally gambling at some point, and it takes and it has nothing to do with your game itself, in my opinion. And that's kind of um, that's the big one for me for vulnerable populations. And like you said earlier, it's you know that applies for children as as well as for older populations. I think, but with the older populations, I do see since the people that have been playing games their entire lives are not fans of. It, uh, as well, like in, in the last research, there, there was some mention of like, I, I don't know, like 60% or something, like there was a high number saying that they hated having to watch advertisements even to uh, to get content of the game, because um, a lot of it happens yeah. on mobile. Loot boxes was mentioned as, as, as a major gripe of the 50 plus demographic as well. So they do seem like the people that know the culture seem to have um, a shield against aggressive monetization like that, that is basically built on, you know, uh, behaviorism and Skinner boxes, but um, yeah, like in, in general, I think that's 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 the biggest one. Like, I could certainly see somebody get into games over seventy and and just getting lost in in, in what's basically a slot machine. So, I think that it is something that requires legislation. I'm I'm really proud that Belgium was one of the first countries to actually legislate it. Um, I think publishers need to communicate the dangers of play very very clearly, as well as you know all the stuff that they are doing to make a game accessible, but also just like, yeah, we are using loot box system or, you know, to make progress in the game, this and that's what you need to do. Um, and I would love for developers to have ways to um, avoid the monetization. You mentioned slot machines and, and gambling and, and casinos and casinos are, we, we haven't, we haven't thought about this, but casinos are of course where you would walk in and see mostly people over 50. Yeah. Right. Right. And yet does that apply to online games? Online gambling games. Yeah. Um, right now, the statistics that's... are still fairly low for that in comparison to just games in general. So that's the good news. But it's still, I mean, you know, I'm sure 20% mm -hmm. or something, or if you'd look it up. Of the 50 I mean, it, it's that's interesting, right? Because obviously casinos, yeah, sure, full of the elderly, but also extremely... Uh, well uh, monitored and mm -hmm. you know the the laws are very very strict on yep. it with video games not so much right well, not but not <laughs> in regards to addictions right like like you see people go in there and sitting in front of those uh, mm -hmm. you know video poker sure. machines and, and slot machines and and you know for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours right yeah. right well and right. those are older those... slot machines like if you compare it with for instance like um I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are sponsored by FanDuel these days, which is also a form of just gambling. And for some reason, yeah. as a society now, this is apparently accepted. While, you know, my mom would never let me do that, you know, <laughs> if I was a 20 year old. <laughs> but like, you know, I, 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 I've, I've, I've uh, had a lot of students that are all just after class, just playing gambling games like that. Yeah. Wow. So I, I, I want to go back and, and essentially ask. So at the end of the day, giving these, uh, the changes in monetization and different attitudes about monetization. Um, do you think that the, is there a difference between the kind of things uh, developers need to watch for um, in terms of making sure they're not taking advantage of vulnerable, of vulnerable populations with, with uh, older players versus kids? Do you think that there's a difference or not? Um. I don't know if there's really much of a difference. I think most of it comes down, if, if we can legislate it, that that it is literally something you're not allowed to do, <laughs> then I would mm -hmm. say it's it's mostly a matter of clear communication. But, you know, I've been in the U.S. since 2013 now, and, like, <laughs> communication is not always uh, in favor of the consumer here. <laughs> like, right. um, to say it lightly, like, I grew up in, in, in a culture where, like even um, political advertising in Belgium, like back when I grew up there, it was very much something that, um, yeah, you can't you you can't talk negative stuff about your opponent. Um, same for medical advertising. Like here is Wisconsin medical advertising, and then blah 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 with all the negative side effects, right? And I, right. you know, so that's the best I kind of have. It like yeah, I mean, 
with older adults, you could communicate things because older adults are, from what I can tell, very aware of the dangers of addiction and games. That's like one of the number one topics on why I wouldn't want to play games because they're very addictive and I want to be very careful with it. So the industry needs to do something about making it clear that there is no danger there. Um, but if, you know, as long as there actually is, because you are monetizing everything based off of um, a behavioral cycle, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, to switch gears now uh, a little bit. Um, do you have any thoughts about the way older adults are depicted in games? Um, oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the research on that topic is kind of um, limited at this point, but there is already plenty of evidence that 50 plus year olds want to see themselves represented in games, uh, sometimes as an idealized self, sometimes as their younger self, sometimes as who they really are with all ups and downs. So like representation matters. And I, I don't think that's a surprise. Like you see that with every demographic, you see that, you know, across age, race, sex, culture. Um, I think looking at content analyses which are very limited as well still but you know we've we, we've done some casual ones on the side we saw things like um we came up with some categories which was like uh usually it's npcs so you have the supporting granny character which is you know an older character that needs something that you need to get for them and they'll help you along give you some progress maybe act as a tutorial type of thing there is the gruesome uh, granny as a villain in horror games a lot of the times where it's like you know like right. body horror basically give your old grandma a kiss yeah. type of thing but like resident evil 7 did that um <laughs> to 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 extremes um i think my colleague robin coleman from uh, florida uh, state university talked about the crone s archetype archetype uh, sorry the crone s um sacrifice archetype which is um mm -hmm. how you have older characters in games that uh, their only function is eventually to to pass away and to be a motivation um dragon age origins mm. i believe was the example but i've never played that game there so you know there's there's a bunch of npcs there um if you're looking at playable characters though it gets even more limited like the there's the action granny stereotype where it's just like okay you it's usually for comedic purposes right like you're old but you're a super badass right, right. and like granny with a shotgun is some is, is how i oftentimes refer to it as well um and beyond that, right, like right. it's 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 mostly unless it's like an indie game that's literally about age, like the game I made myself. Like it comes down to just do you have the option in a character creator? So that's really where we are with representation. It's miles away from what you're seeing on Netflix or you know any other um, streaming platform at this point. I would say or movies. Um, I think it's it's something that will probably change over time. Um, you know the example that I've been giving whenever I talk about this is like I really love Tony Hawk Pro Skaters remake because they didn't make Tony Hawk uh, his 20-year-old or 30-year-old self. Uh, same for Rodney Mullen and Steve Caballero. They they put them in there as 50-year-olds. And, you know, then mm. I looked up like, well, is this an exaggeration or not? Because, like, at the same time doing all these crazy tricks. So maybe this is just an action granny stereotype, right? But then, then I looked up what Tony Hawk can do in a half pipe today. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like... He is still very, yeah. very good at skateboarding. Like, you know, I, I don't know skateboarding that well, but, you know, he still does like all these flips and, and 360s and everything like it's like it's nothing in the video. And so, yeah, like it's 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 age appropriate representation at, at, at that point, I would say. And, and I, I really like that. Like, I would love to see more of that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, aside from that, it's usually like the supporting character type of thing where. You can have a, a general and like, you know, like, yeah, the same as like, I think a Metal Gear Solid had like an, an older Solid Snake at some point character, but again, an action hero type. So it's, uh, it's, it's uncommon to find appropriate representation. I, you know, I've, I realize I've never actually played a game where, uh, I was anyone over 60, hmm. like I think in my life, uh, uh, which is interesting. I mean, it, I'm assuming, I mean, you know, that these are protagonists that have been judged to be non-desirable for a large part of the population. Yeah. No, I, I would imagine so. And Joel in The Last of Us, I'm assuming, is in his 50s. Yeah. You know. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, I wonder. But he's in his ambiguous 50s. <laughs> exactly. You know, Brother right? Yeah, yeah. From... Uh, <laughs> right. A, and, a, rough, and... a rough 45. Yeah, you know, and but he's like he's like a grizzled, you know, he's he's but he's also got to be the the age of a parent, 
mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, and the age of a parent who would fit with that. So he's, but I mean, that's about as old as I can. And in the game, it didn't really seem that old. I think as as in the TV no. series, you know, I thought I I I, I felt like I was playing someone in his thirty, late thirties yeah. or something right. like that. Yeah. Uh, because again, you want to you want to be able to relate to you know your younger audiences and and all that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, okay, so uh, Bob, um, what can societies do that they're not doing now to help seniors uh, access games uh, that would be fun and beneficial for seniors? Yeah, so um, I think you just have to look at the two different um, groups of 50 plus players. Like for people that didn't grow up with games, I think it's curation. Um, I I found that uh, 50 plus year olds that didn't grow up with games usually learn about games through younger generations. Um, their older children or their adult children usually. Um, so I think, and this is something that I think ARP is making some strides with as well right now is to develop more of a mainstream platform to get information about like, okay, these are games that would be of interest to you. These are things, these are games that are first and foremost doing their accessibility properly. So there's never going to be any major barriers, but also like, this is content in the same way that, you know, these are movies that really uh, work for a demographic. Um, these are games you want to look into. I think the curation part is a big one. Um, for people that did grow up with games, um, it's mostly about them being included in, in ways I think we've already kind of discussed. So, you know, making sure there's representation, that there's accessibility, that you're communicating what your game actually is and you're not just being as loud as possible to stand out without, you know, like you don't have to stand out that much uh, in, in the same way that they're trying to do for younger generations. And then it kind of comes down to just, you know, having content that they will find interesting. Like one of the things that I talk about um, as well as like we identified in the research, like six different um, um, aesthetic experiences to, to put it um, that we see with older generations that we don't see with younger ones as much like things like, Oh, I want to cultivate myself from playing, or I want to give back to society, or um, I want to, I want to gain specifically to play with my significant other. Um, or I want mm. a game that is all about nostalgia or that makes me feel like I am completely contemporary up to date with technology, like VR, you know, it's, that's how 50 plus year olds, um, have gotten into VR. It's, it's still very minimal. Um, so like there are specific, mm-hmm. um, you know, aesthetics as we call them in, in, in game design lingo that apply to, to the demographic as well. And, and that's how you can, um, help older players access games or, or make it more fun. Um, if they've grown up with games their entire lives, because I feel for 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 that group, uh, I I read too many comments and in interviews where it's just like, yeah, I used to love games when I was younger, but like uh, it kind of got stale. It's so derivative, like you know, it's all about graphics. I just want something innovative. I just want a, a good story, not just you know another power fantasy or a story that you know like is, is a B movie at best. I want an Oscar worthy video game, you know. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's one of those things that I think um, we can make some strides with. But there's a lot of indie games that I think are already doing a really good job with that anyways. It's just a matter of curation at that point. So, Bob, yeah. when you say curation, so, you know, I was thinking about societies. You know, I, I use societies yeah. right, as, as, opposed to, as opposed to companies. And, uh, you know, my wife uh, used to work for uh, a chain of uh, senior living facilities. So mm-hmm. partly I'm thinking, okay, so in senior living facilities, places, right, they could – you know they can curate, but when I when when you're talking about societies curating, who would be doing the curating? How would curating happen? What does it mean for a society to curate? Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent question. That's something I I probably need to help figure out yet because that's one of the things that um. So I have a research group now. Um, we're turning in, we're hoping to turn into a center at the university pretty soon with a, with a bunch of colleagues that are all super into this topic as well now, um and. You know, one of those, that's one of the major questions that we have right now. Like, how can we make, cause right now, if you look at how older adults learn about certain games, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to reach out to them. Like Facebook, to some extent, um, there are some Facebook groups out there, but in general, um, the 50 plus demographic is way harder to reach than the 20 or 30 plus one. Um, mm-hmm. and I think a big part of it is, is, is just like, okay, it's, it's about building up. Um, 
acceptance for one so that everybody in their families is like, yes, this is something that you should be doing. This is something that will be beneficial to you. Um, and maybe not as much about the beneficial part even, but more about this is beneficial to all of us or this helps us to relate to one another and, and be closer to one another. Um, so I think that's a big part of it, but then also just building networks in, in, in a way that, that people can share information about games that, that, that they like. It's like, yeah, true, you know, like sure retirement communities, but at that point, it's also, that's very late to learn about video games. Like, right, you know, right. you're missing out on a right. lot at that point. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's something to look into because, um, if there's one thing that my research, um, and many of my colleagues have at the same finding has shown, it's like, age is really not that important. It's about context. You know, it's what is your life like? Um, we all mm -hmm. kind of stay 25 in, in, in our minds to some extent. And like, it's, um, how can a game fit within the lifestyle that you have at any given point in your life? Um, and you know, I see that a lot where I have somebody who I interview and I follow up with them in a longitudinal study. And, you know, the first time when I interviewed them, like they just get in there, they just got them to play a game, like something casual, you know, and, um, sure. They got it from their grandkid. Like maybe they're playing plants versus zombies or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. but then like you, you get back in touch with them a year later or so, and all of a sudden they're playing second life or they're, they're playing an MMORPG because, it went from one thing to another. It snowballed a little bit. Super cool. Um, but then another year later, their partner got a terminal illness and they've been cast into this caregiver role. And now all of a sudden, all they do is like Microsoft Solitaire for like an hour a week just to get away from the stress. Um, because the right. people that they used to play World of Warcraft with aren't in line anymore when they are available and their life has completely shifted. And like there's mm -hmm. all these things, like the, the extent that people are involved with communities and and, and have active roles because like so many 50 plus roles are super active and super busy way more like being mindful i can't believe i haven't even mentioned that yet organically in, in the conversation i guess up until this point like being mindful of people's time is such a big deal and mm, games yeah. suck at it they're so bad at it like you know that was one of the goals when i made my own game as well like i want to make a game that you can finish in an hour <laughs> Because like that right. is usually when i would like to finish most of my games like a meaningful experience in an hour um, cause like, yeah, when I, you know, I can, I can play games for, for longer than an hour on vacation, but I'm a very busy person. And like, that's not going to change when I'm 60. I think like, I, I, I don't like, I am somebody who wants to be doing stuff all the time. I, I, I love making stuff. Right. And there's so many people that I interview that have major hobbies that are contributing, that are giving back, that, that are doing all these different roles. And yeah, they have like three hours a week to play games and they would love to play a great game. That's just as good as a Netflix series, but those things are very difficult to find. So, you know, right. it's, it's a really big answer to a simple question, partially because I don't know how to get there, but I, I do know that there's a lot of value if we could get there as a society. Uh, could I just say, I think the, the point about time is, is really, really, yeah. really, really important, right? Uh, huge. I, I, I do want to go back to this idea of, of curating because i find the idea really interesting and it, it also makes me think of uh you know um in co in countries where you have a ministry of culture mm. right it seems like that would be kind of the obvious place where the ministry of culture could curate you know these games but the u.s doesn't have a ministry of culture mm. um right it's it's as far as I know, the only country in the world that doesn't have a ministry of culture, I'm I'm really not, uh, you know, the idea is uh, that's we too have a, We have elitist. a State Department that does that. N no, right. I mean, the idea of ministry of culture will put on cultural events, will make sure the, the culture is transmitted for, to the people, right? Um, the State Department has uh, people that will export American culture to other oh, yeah. to other countries right uh for soft power and you know issues issues like that um but they but, also but they also it's also mm. where you you get grants for things that are that are um are cultural uh in some cases uh, that that's that's mm. interesting but mm. but i was thinking uh since you work with the warp um are they the kind of natural uh place to at least a group that is concerned with people over the age of 50 that, you know, that could curate for them. Yeah, uh, no. And if not, is there anybody, any other organization that, that could do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, being a foreigner or a permanent resident in the U S like 
for me, the the clear organization that would be an amazing fit for was AARP. So, I mean, I was super excited when they, they, they got in touch with me because, yeah, like, I think the work that they have been doing across the entire spectrum of, of, of retirement and, and later life and, and, and just um, looking at ways on how to advocate for the needs of 50 plus year olds across anything really is, is, it's been phenomenal. And I think this is a natural fit for them. They've, they've really started to, to do this in two, since 2016. And, and, you know, it's, it's a work in progress, obviously, but this year they put on an amazing game summit where they invited the industry over to come, um, you know, well, I was one of the speakers there. They also had uh, Trip Hawkins, um, the founder of Electronic Arts, speak there. Um, and they presented the findings of their latest survey there for the industry. And they, they, they set up uh, some, some consultancy opportunities for them as well. And they got a good uptake there. Like, they're, you know, it, it was a good audience um, that they built up. They were also present at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. So, you know, I see a lot of positive uh, change there. And I think they're going to be at the forefront of, of making this happen. I don't know the U.S. Um, well enough, I think, to to be like, oh, yeah, you know, there are other major players that I would see. Like, it would be great if politically there would be um, more support for this type of work, obviously. But there are so many other fields that would say the exact same thing. <laughs> so I'm like, right. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, like, I think this has a very strong health connection. But I, like I've mentioned earlier, uh, I, I I prefer to... To, I, I prefer to fight my battles for this or advocate for this without having to pull the health card. I think that it's more healthy, <laughs> how, how contradictory that might sound. But like um, in general, you know, I, I think there is certainly a, um, a role there um, for politicians there to to help facilitate initiatives and like, yeah, Ministry of Culture, like Belgium sent, uh, but I was just thinking, was that culture? But I, I, I looked it up as, as, as you were asking the question and like, uh, it's Minister of uh, Youth Media and uh, um, Fighting Poverty, actually, which I, I, I wasn't hmm. expecting. Hmm. Um, but yeah, like, so we had one of our ministers go into the Game Developers Conference to talk to developers and see how we could play a role there and how, because Belgium actually has some very, very good um, game programs. So, um, yeah, the, I think there is a lot of ways to, to help with this, but I think ARP is certainly um, at the forefront of this right now. I don't think there's anybody else that is, is making so many ways right now as they are. All right. Uh, last question. Unless, Andy, unless you got anything? Okay. No, this has been fascinating. Last question. Uh, Bob, uh, what, what do you want to leave our guests with? And uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, I'm sure often hard for professors. So, um, I might be preaching to the choir there, but like my takeaway for this would basically be, um, as I'm sure you've figured out already, play is the most important and meaningful thing that a human can do in their lives, I feel, no, no matter what people might tell you. Um, <laughs> as long as people are providing moderation and variety and you, you find meaning in what you're playing and, and who you're playing with, I think uh, it would be one of the best things that you can do for yourself and the people around you. Um, and that includes, because I got a lot of people that ask me about, what about this or that game? And they're, you know, just trying to provoke, but like that includes any game. Um, and that certainly doesn't change as you grow older. I think that's true across the entire lifespan. You're never too old to play. So keep playing games and make sure to involve the people you care about. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, Andy and I have a special announcement here. Uh, essentially, that announcement is that um, over the past two and a half years, we've been uh, we've been working on these seventy six uh, episodes. Um, we've talked to people from all over the world, uh, from a great variety of uh, of professions. Uh, and uh and fields uh people who are experts in so many things we had no idea about it was absolutely fascinating uh we're so glad to have brought them uh to you uh and we think it's about that time for us to take a break uh we're not absolutely sure we're coming back from this break but i for one am exhausted right and we're going into a very busy fall so now is the time if we're going to take a break now is the time to do it yeah uh, we we want to thank everybody that's listened to the show, uh, all our guests, uh, and everything that we have taken away from you, um, and uh, as, especially the uh, the guests that have had programs designed to help other people. We really really appreciate uh, what you all have done. Um, take a look. Yeah, back we're super grateful that you took the time. 
no, take uh, take take a, a look at the back catalog of of all those episodes that were before this one. Um, and I want to thank Andy. Andy was an awesome co-host, right, for all this time. <laughs> well, well, I couldn't have done it without you. You're you're awesome, and uh, and I had a great time doing it. Uh, I think I've, I'm actually very, very proud of what, of, of these 76 episodes, and uh, I think we did a good thing. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, play nice. You can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.